This is Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida, delivering the sermon September 1, 2013, at Church of the Resurrection, Longwood, Florida. I'm going to invite us to pray together, but here's what I would like to do. There are two ways to pray. Well, there's one way where you sort of wait for somebody else to pray, and then there's another way when you really pray. Uh, the first part would be when I would pray, you dutifully close your eyes, but you'd actually be thinking about what's going to happen later in the service, or what you're going to do after the service is over. There's another way of praying where you actually volitionally make the decision out of the heart to be in the presence of God. That's what I think about when I think of prayer. Why do I do that? Because I'm really asking God to do a miracle. And the miracle is this. Sure, I've done my prep. And I have things that I'd like to say. But only God actually knows what He would like to communicate to us, myself included, in the congregation this morning. I'd might much rather hear what God has to say than what I've prepared. Um, hopefully they'll coincide. But we'll see. We're going to ask the Lord to come and to help us with this, that his word might be proclaimed. Are you up for that? Yes. Let's, let's pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you for the promise of your presence. That when we gather together in the name of your Son, he is here. Open our hearts and our minds to his presence. You who know all of who we are, we would say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now, some of you would say, "Well, that's kind of pretty gutsy." Other people would say, "That is presumptuous and ludicrous at best." So, let's see. As many of you know, or some of you know anyway, if you follow me on Twitter or on Facebook, my wife and I have been away on vacation for the past few weeks. And it's given me some time, among other things, besides enjoying the company of our son and daughter-in-law and doing some other things while we were away, to actually think about the whole task of what it is that I'm about to do, which is preach a sermon. Last week, and not actually all that long ago, a very famous Nobel Prize-winning poet Seamus Heaney from Ireland uh, passed away. And he just said this about what it meant to be a poet. He said the job of the poet is to, quote, be on the side of the undeceiving world. To be on the side of the undeceiving world. I would actually say the same is true for a preacher. Because it's the responsibility of the preacher, if he or she is to be faithful, in, on the one hand, to be clear about what the scripture teaches but to be able to articulate it in a way that actually connects with the hearers so that it's not just platitude. It actually becomes something that is alive and living and even, hopefully, by God's mercy, make a difference in the hearers who take it in. Because you see, the temptation is to say things that make sense, sound good, noble, you know, mom and apple pie, you love Jesus, don't we? And yet, what actually happens is, is that it all goes right over our heads. Nothing, nothing actually happens inside of our heart. And it can even be over, and you can never it's over. People will say, oh, that's a good sermon. But has actual life been transmitted? Has a heart been changed? Have people encountered God in some way? That's actually the task. It's not merely to develop and deliver a fine essay, or to be clever, or to be funny, or a lot of the other things that happen when somebody's in the pulpit. And none of those are bad in and of themselves. I mean, I'm certainly no kind of no solemn. There's too much joy in the gospel to be that way. But it seems to me the real call is to actually say things that pierce the heart. Not in a way that causes people necessarily to feel bad. <laughs> Although sometimes that happens. But rather than say that invite them to draw into, in a more deep way, the relationship that can be theirs in Jesus. 
And even this morning, the temptation is to give a very good sermon based on the moral exhortations that are in the scriptures, because they are full of them. But here's what happens. It would be really easy for me to stand up and say, okay, here's what the scripture teaches. I mean, the writer of Hebrews gives you a whole list, as does Jesus when he's telling the story about uh, the book your father Paul said earlier about humility is right. Now, don't, don't get engaged in hospitality in a way that just merely feels like good pro quo reciprocity. Oh, we gotta have somebody else over because they have been over. But rather think about something that's a lot more generous than that. That actually includes people who could never ever pay you back. Why? Because that's what God's love looks like. What God's love looks like is a generosity, a compassion, an extraordinary, powerful kindness that actually changes the hearts that causes us to say, however could I begin to repay you? I cannot. It's not within my power to do so. Because your love and your mercy and your grace are so much greater than anything that's going on inside of my heart. That's one. So in other words, instead of standing up and saying, here's what you must do, because this is what the scripture says, what you would do to that is some of you would go say, yeah, yeah, that's right. And actually feel a kind of pride about the fact that maybe you're doing some of those things. That's not the goal of the serpent. Some of you would feel badly about the fact that you're not doing the things that the scripture teaches. And you'd feel guilty, but after a while, it would eventually go away. I mean, most of us create a kind of Faustian bargain when it comes to the teachings of the scriptures. There's some that we buy into, but there's some that we don't. And we're, to use the vocabulary, we're okay with that. Because after all, this is my life and I live in the real world. Or we use some other kind of way to shield ourselves from what's really going on in the scriptures. Because what is really going on in the scriptures is not merely a set of moral teachings. It's challenging in a very direct way the pride of our own self-sufficiency. That's why Jesus ups the ante the way he does. We need to throw a bank Don't just invite your rich neighbors. Invite the poor. I don't know hardly anybody who does that. And, and he does that not because, not only because he's trying to say something about hospitality that is different than reciprocity. He's actually trying to lay out something of what God gives and does for each of us who, by comparison to him, are very, very poor in spirit. Are we not? Yes, not your head. You see, it's our heart that he's after. What he wants to do, you see, in the, both in the teaching of Hebrews as well as in the teaching that Jesus gives in the Gospel reading, is to really come after in a very direct way anything that says, I know how to please God and make it on my own. Thank you very much. And so cut that off at the knees that what we are left with is, oh God, I wish you'd come in your mercy. I've got nothing. And I need you. Because when we are able to say out of a deep place inside of us that we need God and that the pretensions are gone and that somehow the ability to look good and to act right and do the things we know we're supposed to do really are filthy rags. They're not good enough and we know it in the presence of God. Then that's what actually God begin to do, can begin to do things in our hearts that otherwise we would be entirely close to. Even on a sunny morning, it's really okay, but it's not sufficient to somehow to look good and for the music to be great, which it is, and for us all to look good and do the wonderful stuff, and yet at the same time allow the liturgy to literally go right over our heads, to perform as if somehow we're in this great divine drama, and yet have absolutely nothing touch us in the deepest part of who we are. And when that begins to happen, when we begin to think about this as a performance, when we think about our relationship with God as a list of do's and don'ts, what begins to happen inside of us is a hardness starts to creep in. We get very critical of other people because they're not doing as well as we think we ought to be doing, or they. It feels kind of competitive. There's an inordinate attention to detail because after all, all we've got is that we've just got to look right, you know. And so if the acolyte messes up, it becomes a point of gossip. Did you see what she did? 
between you and I. What happened to the trainer? How come that was allowed to happen? Or we sort of get our scorecards out when it comes to how well the liturgy is or the music or the caliber of the sermon because we think somehow it's a performance and we get to grade it. All of that, all of that is based upon a misunderstanding of what church is all about and what the gospel is all about. Because what the gospel is all about is God literally laying our hearts bare and cram your new What's the opening prayer? Almighty God, to you, all hearts are what? Open. Open. All desires known from you, no secrets are hid. I tell you, there are times when I hear that prayer, I want to hide under the pew. But what Cranmer's trying to say is that the basis of what we're doing as we gather this morning is not based on performance. Instead, it's based on Jesus, who calls us together, who speaks words of mercy and of forgiveness, who rebuke the proud and makes room for those who are willing to come into God's presence precisely as they are. And know that if they come in God's presence as they are, then they can be changed in a way that causes them to know a kind of power, a kind of dignity, a kind of grace and mercy that only God can give us. Anything other than that, quite honestly, is pretension. What does Jesus say about people like that? These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That feels like a lot of churches I know. So that even in this morning's lessons, in the Hebrews, where all of these things about hospitality and loving one another are laid out, in the very middle of it, the writer of Hebrews gives us the clue as to what the basis of all of this is. The basis of it is our relationship with Jesus himself, who says, I will never leave you or forsake you, so that we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? You see, if you know that in your heart of hearts, if you know that Jesus sees everything about who you are, good, bad, ugly, and indifferent, and instead of looking at it and there being shame, instead, what happens is mercy. Forgiveness, a cleansing and a washing of the slate clean, then that creates a kind of inner empowerment that no self of course can begin to use. All of the gurus about wanting to help us with our self image literally fall in the dust in comparison to what Jesus is offering us here. A kind of healing and nurture strength that comes deep from inside because he puts it in us and out of that we actually do begin to look at people differently and begin to do the very things that the writer of Hebrews calls us to do. We begin to care for people. There's a new kind of compassion because we're not trying to earn anything. We're not trying to look better than other people. We understand we're all in the same boat together. And so when someone has a need, I know how to be there. I'm not going to stand and criticize them. I'm going to come to their aid because, quite frankly, that could be me. Right? What's the line? There are for the grace of God to lie. Out of that, hospitality flourishes. Mutual love is exalted. And it's not just a lot of, hey, how are you? But it becomes the opportunity in relationships for us to speak transparently with one another about who we really are. Because we are serving a God before whom all hearts are open. And we already know that we're forgiven. When that begins to happen, family, that's church. Anything else is a lot of black heavy cocktail chatter and a lot of really nice performance. Who needs that? So this morning, what I don't want to do is give you a list of all the things you should and should not do. We know that anyway. But instead, what I want to do is invite you into a relationship with Jesus for what you know is a new depth of His mercy and His love, where you know that you can be absolutely real in His presence 
and know that he will not forsake you. That he will, in fact, come to your aid. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? That's the invitation of the gospel. Remember, you know, in the opening collect, he says this, Grant us, O Lord, no, sorry, Lord of all power, the author and giver of all good things. What's the first thing he asks? Grant in our hearts, graft in our hearts, sorry, the love of your name. Not help us to do that. Because the more we know him, the more we love him, the more we know his love for us, everything else begins to flow. Life becomes changed. We know a sense of joy. It is winsome and gracious and altogether lovely. That's what I have for. That's what I want more than anything. That's what I want church to be about. Because we'll fail miserably at the other stuff. What are we going to do when we do? Cut somebody out because they don't belong or measure up? It could be me or you. No, we serve together because we know we, there is one who forgives all, all that we have done. And he fills us with his love and mercy. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And that's what calls us together today. To say yes to Him and to know a love that will not let us go. Let us pray again. Gracious Lord, thank you that we don't have to be content with to-do to -do lists, chatting conversations, we can come into your presence and open our hearts to you. We can be real with you. And that you can come and touch us in transparent ways that profoundly change us. And Lord, that's what we long for. Come, O oh Lord, and be our Savior. That we might know your joy and be greatly greatly glad for all of the mercies that you continue to give us. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray.